Um, yeah, I, I had planned to talk a little bit about myself. I, I guess if I anyone's curious, you know, how I got into glass or whatever, at some point, you know, you can ask <clears throat> afterwards. I guess I don't really feel like I, I need to talk about that too much unless, you're in, unless anybody's interested, so we can maybe do that later. Um, thank you for the introduction, Betsy, and thank you, Allison, uh, if she's still here, um, for the opportunity. I'm pretty happy to be here is quite an honor and a privilege I'm talking at the art museum. Um, I am here to talk about the uh, William Morris artifact panel. This is the piece I chose. Um, you might be wondering why I chose the piece. Uh, I got the, one of the good things about doing a talk here is that you get to come and visit and go through the collection a few times. And um, I thought in order to prep myself for looking at objects and stuff, I. I would reread the, um, a book. Maybe you, some of you are familiar with it. It's um, the book uh, "Seeing is Forgetting the Thing." Uh, Seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees by Robert Irwin. Uh, he has a per, uh, piece in the collection um, in the Contemporary Wing. He's a very high concept artist, um, but it, his way of looking at things is very informative. And I was wandering through all the galleries trying to choose a piece and contemplating sort of my perpetual and sort of curious, visceral dislike of Robert Rauschenberg's work, and should I talk about that, or no, I didn't want to do a hit piece really and like that, or should I talk about um, Robert Irwin's piece, but Ethan Rose had already done that piece, and all that sort of stuff, and I sort of thought, what would people be interested in? Would they really want to hear, you know, a glass craft-based artist grappling with his ideas about conceptual art? Probably not. So I chose this piece for, you know, for obvious reasons, because I'm, I'm going to know a little bit more about it. I have some personal anecdotes about William Morris, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I just thought it would um, be a little bit more, more interesting. Um, obviously, I'm drawn to the nature of the work in the glass. And for me, I, I'm sort of a maximalist in my own work. I have this tendency towards the Baroque that I can't seem to be able to avoid. So this sort of maximal visual effect, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to really check this piece out. Obviously, well, afterwards, it you know, goes down three floors. And it, you, your eye really moves through it. Um, I think most everyone likes, likes it to some extent. Um, I like the way you know the shadows play in certain spots where the shadow of the piece is you know directly behind a form that's not the form making the shadow, and, you know all those you know upfront visual things that are that are just fun to look at. And then just again up front, content wise, you know this it's kind of mysterious. You know all the shapes are very they're they're referential in a way, but. They're almost kind of, you know, they refer to certain stuff, but they're, they're mysterious. And um, also for me as a glass blower, I know a little bit about William Morris's techniques. I'm gonna, I like, have a hard time calling William Morris. Everyone calls him Billy Morris, so I'll probably refer to it as that. I don't know if he likes that or not, but I, 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 won't, be able to, I won't be able not to. But um, as a glass blower, I work primarily in clear glass. And, I, I love the beauty of the material, and I, I spent a lot of time working with the optics and stuff. And he's, he's not into that so much, and I'll, I'll get into that more later. But from a technical standpoint, being a glass blower, there's ways of coloring and shaping glass here that I have no idea at all. Even after blowing glass for 20 years, I have no idea how some of these pieces were made. Um, so that's all like my surface reasons for choosing the piece and the things that I like sort of get into. Um, again, I said like I, I'm a maximalist, and sometimes you know, my my one of my old art teachers said, you know, less you know less is more. Everyone, <laughs> less is more. And then he said, but you know, on rare occasions, a lot more is also more. <laughs> and so that's sort of what we're dealing with here, I, I think. Um, you know, and it's, it's so rich. The textures are rich. The colors are rich. The shapes are sort of rich. And yet, there's also this sense of control 
and restraint, you know, in the, in the presentation, in the format, in the grid. Um, I think one of our friends, and we were, um, my, my wife Belle and, and I were here with our friend Tracy, and she made this interesting sort of abstract comparison to the artist Matthew Barney, um, whose work is mostly film-based, but he does a lot of sculpture too, and he, he's highly, highly conceptual, but also very visual, not minimal, completely over the top, maximal in every way visually, and yet the theme that underlies the entire current of his work is restraint. Um, I think that that restraint combined with the maximalism sort of creates a, in, in a sort of a dynamic kind of a tension. Um, to contrast that, uh, if we turn around and look down the hallway, uh, down the ways that if you if you're in the position to do so, you can see uh, Dale Chihuly's red piece back there, um, which is also totally maximal, but without the restraint, you know? It's, it's, it's not controlled. It's, it may be perhaps that's what it's about a little bit, being out of control. I'll, I'll come back to that. <laughs> so the other thing I was thinking about when we were walking around here is that art, uh, when I think about art and artists and, and making work, is that when an artist is starting out to make a work, I think that he's he or she is probably deeply involved in this process of asking questions. And I think of every piece that's made and shown as a potential answer to that question. One of several, maybe. But <clears throat> um, different artists ask different questions, clearly, which is the whole range of work in the museum from you know, conceptual to minimal to maximal to abstract expression, et cetera, et cetera. Anyone, everyone's doing their, their own thing. But if a piece is successful, I think it's going to answer some sort of questions. And I always like to think about what is the question? What questions are the artists asking themselves? And I think that <clears throat> you should be able to learn, kind of see and infer a lot about the artist and the artist's personality by the questions that he's asking and by the answer he or she is asking and by the answers that they're coming up with. I like to know, I, I like to be able to feel the personality of the artist in the work. Uh, that, that's something for me that helps make a piece successful. And um, these questions and answers, I, what, what questions, again, sort of just surface off the, off the top of my head, what, what questions could Billy Morris be asking with this piece? Um, I see, you know, a lot of man-made vesselware and quite a few man-made shapes, a lot of natural shapes, uh, you know, natural forms, lots of birds. I counted up the birds. I forget. There's a lot. There's a lot of birds. Um, out of these 399 pieces, it turns out to be 399. Um, he's asking questions like. Uh, this is just things that were coming into my head. Man in nature, man with nature, man versus nature. There's an archaeological aspect to it. Man in time, culture in time. There's, that, there's a time element to it, clearly. He's referencing a lot of you know, like ancient cultures, things from the past, the archaeological record, how things are, are sort of in layers here. These are all things that sort of... <clears throat> These are the questions that, that, that he's looking at. And when a piece is really humming, you know, really working f for me, I think it's obvious that the artist is asking him, him his or herself these, these questions and, and sort of digging really deep. And I think that in order this, this creative impulse to, to make questions and to come up with questions and make answers, I think it's like this basic kind of raw humanist impulse that'll, that a lot of people have if they are interested and engaged in the world. Because if you're interested and engaged in the world, you're gonna go out there and you're gonna use your five senses and take all that tactile information that you're looking at in your day-to-day -day world. And you're gonna internalize it somehow. And you're gonna abstract those ideas with all of, your, all of the thoughts and intentions and your background experience that you bring that you carry with you on your day-to-day -day basis. You ex abstract that and come up with your own subjective ideas about the world you're in. 
and then you reflect on it, and you come up with a response. You make an action, include a reference in order to communicate, in order to create a dialogue with the people around you. That's why I call it like a humanist impulse. I think we're here to create things and speak about our experience, our own personal natural history, and communicate with other people in the world. I think that's why we're here. We're creative by nature if we're engaged in the world around us and the people that we're surrounded by. Now, again, I said I'd come back to the Chihuly piece, and um, I actually like that piece for quite a few reasons, and I'm not going to diss Chihuly. Any glass artist, studio glass artist owes, that's practicing today, making a living, owes him a huge debt. We wouldn't be here without him, including probably, including William Morris. Um, and I'm happy he's making the work, or made and, and is making the work that he's making, but in that Chihuly piece, I don't see a lot of deep question asking. I don't see any you know, digging so much there. You know? uh, there. There's not a lot of questions and, or answers coming out of that piece to me, and not a lot of other references. It's just sort of his thing. It's not really so much like a, a reef of reflection of the world around. It's sort of just more like an erection. <laughs> It's sort of <laughs> how I felt about it. Um, and like I said, I don't mean to diss, but uh, it, it's, it, it's interesting that they're across the way. And uh, another interesting part about that is that um, William Morris and Dale Chihuly's careers are really deeply intertwined. So here's a little bit about Billy Morris. He, uh, he was born in Carmel, California, and um, he actually got... Um, involved with glass originally up at uh, Pilchuck Glass School in, near Everett, Washington. By um, He was hired as a truck driver for the school. No prior experience with glass at all. And apparently he dug it. Apparently he finally got in the hot shop and um, had a hand for it. Uh, because within a few years he was teaching classes at Pilchuck. And within a, you know, about 10 years or so, he was um, Del Giuli's head gaffer. That means the, the, the guy that actually is blowing the glass, the, the head, <coughs> the, the first chair, as it were, the person that's actually making the piece. Del Giuli doesn't make his own work, but he, he can't. <coughs> so um, he did that for about 10 years. Um, and then he, he quit being Chihuly's gaffer after, after that time and set up his own studio. And he has a team of anywhere from like five to seven people. Around the time that this piece was being made in 2000 and, and the, this, this artifact series that he was working on from about 1994 to about 2004, um, he had a, a team of uh, a bunch of people, um, Ross Richmond, Karen Willenbrink, John Ombrecht, Randy Walker, Rick Allen, and Kimberly Howe. Many of these artists have gone on to be successful glassblowers with their own careers in their own time, just like you know, William Morris moved on past Chihuly. All these other artists have moved through Billy Morris, um, Karen Willenbrink being one of, one of my favorite artists out there. Um, <clears throat> Billy Morris is a, um, an, uh, an outdoorsman. He is a... He's a physical specimen. If you ever seen a picture of the man, he, he's in the videos on his website. He's he's this one that's really funny. He's like, I don't like to wear clothes. He's always never has a shirt on, right? <laughs> he's always like tan. He's got his hair back in a ponytail. He's got this sort of fierce jaw. He's just like ripped, like veins just like popping out, you know, and just like you know running up a hill with rawr, he's like a caveman, right? Like super mega dude outdoor adventure. Rawr. Um, He's a bow hunter. He goes and bow hunts for weeks on end by himself, like in the Wallawas and the Elkhorn Mountains and the Bitterroots in Montana and Idaho. Um, it's not surprising, looking at the work, that you'd, there's this outdoorsman, you know, hunter um, guy. He, he's like, he's a, he's a rock climber. Um, he paraglides all the time. He'll walk up with his paraglider on his back, jump off a mountain, fly down, and then hike out another 20 miles. You know, that's just what he does for fun. <laughs> um, he kind of is. Yeah, I've, I've, when, he, when you see him in, in conferences and stuff, or people talk about him, you know, like at trade shows and craft shows and stuff, you know, women are like, oh, all the women are like, oh, Billy Morris is over there. 
I heard lots of swooning. Um, so he made a, he's made a lot of work. He started in the you know, late 70s and worked up until 2007. Um, and he's extremely successful, extremely wealthy now. Um, retired at age 49, moved to Hawaii. He likes to like swim with sharks. There's a video of him swimming with sharks. I assume he bathes in hot lava. And <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's a little bit about him. Um, it's hard to sort of underestimate. I talked about Dale Chihuly. Without Dale Chihuly, we wouldn't be here because he sort of helped move this studio glass movement, you know, to the Pacific Northwest, and then made it so popular. He create, single-handedly created a demand for handmade you know, glass art. But William Morris' influence is totally on a different, sort of a different level. Um, and I just want to talk about that for a second. If you do the most surface, the most surface um, research and go on Wikipedia, I'm always dubious, um, it says, William Morris is an American glass artist who's been able to change the history of art in his lifetime. <laughs> Bold, <laughs> bold. <laughs> that's a, I, I'm, I, he can't write that himself, so yeah, that's one of the rules. Um, but that's pretty bold. Um, his work is an attempt to add to the archaeological record of humankind. That I like. I, I do like that. See, seeing as how some of this glass probably could very well outlast the, you know, the upcoming apocalypse. Um, there's another, uh, James Ude is an art critic. He focuses in a lot of craft stuff. And in one of Will and the books uh, about this particular artifact series, he says something I think feels a, a little bit more accurate. He says, William Morris is the central participant in the transformation of an art activity, glass blowing, that has recently rendered meaningless earlier distinctions between fine art and craft-based art. So everyone's probably somewhat familiar with like the craft arts being wood, fiber, ceramic, glass, metal, as opposed to more fine arts of you know painting, photography, and things that are in a fine art museum versus a craft museum. There's that ongoing debate, which we could talk for days on, that I don't care to get too into right now. But William Morris is credited as, as sort of transforming glass blowing and making it this making it fine art. He's like the first person to really turn it into something completely different. And if you're not familiar with his work, he, this, is, this is just one sort of style. There, it's not usually a, a massive thing like this. Um, but his work is very lyrical. I encourage you to, to check out some of his forms. It's nothing like my work. I, can, I love looking at it. It's just it's wonderful to look at. It's really fun. It's just fun, fun interesting stuff. So this craft debate. Harvey Littleton was the founder of the studio glass movement, started in Toledo in 1962, a long time ago. Um, and Harvey Littleton being a teacher and the guy that was the first guy to build a glass furnace basically in his garage and say, hey, let, we can do this here. We don't need to have a factory to do this. Um, he was also a teacher and made his own work. Harvey Littleton uh, once uttered this thing at a conference in the mid 60s. He said, technique is cheap. And it was extremely hotly debated amongst craft artists at that time. And they were thinking, well, technique and craft is something where you have to spend your 10,000 hours and practice in order to be good. And what do you mean technique is cheap? You know, this is, we're talking about, we're talking about craft. And he said, he, there's so much controversy about this because it's a very provocative statement. He said that, he had to clarify himself. He says, technique is available to everyone. You can read or practice technique if you have any background at all. Anyone can do that. But the technique in the hands of a strong creative person takes on an entirely other dimension. And I, you know, you latch on to what, strong creative person. What is a strong creative person? Um, I think a strong creative person is somebody that has a deep interest in the world and the things around them and asking those questions that has a deep sense of that humanist impulse that I was talking about before. A strong creative person is someone that's willing, um, that's really interested in creating dialogue and communicating. It's invigorative and very importantly in this case, especially innovative. Um, somebody who's kind of come alive, you know, and I'm reminded of this uh, Howard Thurman quote. Many of you guys have uh, heard about it. I heard about it through another artist friend in town, you know, Jennifer Rabin. Um, 
it says, he said that um, don't, don't ask what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and choose to do that. Because what the world needs is more people that have come alive. And I think that William Morris is one of those people. He's really taken glass blowing and as craft into another dimension. The way he's done this is he's got his own vocabulary of forms and his, his thing, he's jamming on this archeological feeling and everything. He's got his themes that are, that are interesting and engaging and he has his own style and his own voice. But further, I think that um, what's most important is he came up with a whole new way of working with glass, like in the hot shop, in the studio. It's still sort of mysterious. He doesn't have anybody but his team in there. He doesn't let the public, he doesn't do demonstrations. He keeps things kind of locked down, kind of, kind of secret. Everyone knows that his innovations in the hotshot, he's got you know, specialized tools that he's made himself and specialized torches, special ways of coloring and patterning the glass that no one had ever seen before in the, in the late 80s and 90s when he started making this work. Um, no one else's glass looks like this, almost nobody. One of the things that um, he gets into, you know, quite unlike my work, he is, um, well, I'll mention that in a second, excuse me, um, in, instead, of, um, instead of focusing on glasses sparkle, you know, like the clear glass and the sparkle, he, he tends to deny that in a lot of the surface treatment um, because he, he focuses on glass's ability to imitate other things and not just be sparkly glass that everyone, you know, that most people, you know, if you just keep it on sparkly glass, you're gonna go into Chihuly land over there, you know. Um, but he's focusing on how glass imitates other things. Like, and you can see things are looking like ceramics and wood and bronze and leather and, you know, sinew and fiber, there's little wraps around certain things, you know, it's, it's, he's using glass to do all kinds of other stuff and we're looking at a lot of it on this, the reflected light coming through this, the reflected light coming off of these patterns and these pieces and these forms, but also glass is still glass, which is why it's cool and there's this transmitted light coming through the forms also, which is one of the reasons why it's, I think, in, from my opinion, so, so fabulous to look at, the interplay of transmitted light versus reflected light. So, artifact panel. Um, if, if anyone has any technical questions, I can, I can do my best to answer them afterwards. Um, but he's still very much using offhand glass blowing techniques, you know, blowing glass at the bench um, in the traditional way, 3,000 years old. Um, a lot of the pieces are solid, they're, you know, they're, they're sculpted hot. He uses specialized torches to spot heat stuff. Um, pull them and, and twist them in different ways. Um, most of these pieces are acid etched, I think, after the fact, um, to create that sort of matte finish so they're not shiny anymore. Sometimes he'll do things in his patterning, like um, dunk the, you know, put, put a layer of color over the edge of the piece and then dunk it in water so it crackles the surface and then inflate it a little bit so there's these cracks and then dust another layer of powder just in the cracks and then wipe off the rest so it leaves this, you might find a piece that has these, these, these real, this sort of fractured looking surface. Or he'll lay out patterns of, of, of glass frit on a, on a board and then roll up, the, roll up that frit along, uh, on, the, on the bubble of glass to create uh, patterns. These little, little micro vacuums to draw with the glass on the surface. Um, Again, yeah, if you have any other questions about certain things that you see, I could try and answer them. But um, I, I, I get the feeling that a lot of these pieces are ex experiments for larger works. Like I said, most of his works are not tiny like this. Like the little individual things, they're quite large. In fact, he's one of the, he makes some of the largest work out there that's able to be made out of glass. Some of his pieces are absolutely enormous. He makes these, tusks, these like mastodon tusks that are, you know, from me to the elevator. That weigh, you know, a tremendous amount. I don't even know how, I don't even know how they're made. Um, so I think that this is probably little, ex little color experiments, little pattern experiments, textures, um, little, little forms that probably 
they weren't quite cool enough for the piece he was going to attach them to, but they were put off to the side, and then they were building up and building up and building up, and finally, and finally he's like, oh, oh, this one's still got a little magic to it, you know, we'll save this one, put this aside, don't throw that in the, in the scrap bin yet, we'll save it for something else. That's sort of the feeling I get here, because it's very experimental in a lot of these forms. Um, doing a little bit more research, though, I, I, was, I got really interested in, um, you know, what is his motivation here? It seems like um, he's really psychologically invested in finding his place in relation to nature and his surroundings, and that's why he's always out in the, out in the wilderness, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, commune with nature, to be in nature, to be with nature, to be, you know, just to be and nature at the same time, to, to be in time, you know, man in time, and to, you know, use cultural references to find his own, his own personal place. <clears throat> I like to think he's telling a story or a narrative, you know, about, about the human position in general in relation to our consciousness and how we as human beings have um, sort of depicted this relationship historically. That's sort of how it feels archaeological to me. It seems like he's asking the question in a way like, what is it? I don't feel it feels like a stretch. He's asking it like, what is it to be human? How am I, how am I fitting in with the, with the cosmos here? And um, Tina Oldnow is the uh, curator of the Corning Museum in New York. And she said this, in looking at Morris's art, we are reminded of what it is to be ancient and what it is to be human. Momentarily reconnect with that elemental aspect of our psyches that is prehistoric. This is the territory that Carl Jung termed the collective unconscious, a potent repository of meaning and experience. I, I feel like he's, he is, he's like mining his own primal instinct, you know, in making his art. That's, that's his way of, of talking, of, of um, creating dialogue. We're in the, you know, this comes up from, you know, the Native American arts here, and pretty obviously there's, I could see quite a few references to Native American culture, but also there's sort of, there's a lot of sort of Egyptian forms too, and African forms and a lot of the combs and a lot, just there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of that culture you know there's Persian influences in a lot of the forms um, even Greek uh, any kind of prehistoric civilization you could you can sort of find in there but it's not like he's trying to give us an art history lesson either I don't feel like it's not didactic in that. It seems to me like he's more trying to, again, communicate personally with these cultures. Like he's, he wants to connect with their rituals and their gods himself by making the work. Like this work is like the, the ritual itself. He, he performed the ritual and this is what's left over when, when he's thinking about, about history and his place in it. <clears throat> Because you know, in, in these ancient cultures, they're they're very much part of nature and finding their place in it. You know, all the, the animism and all of the different ways of you know controlling. You know, thinking of controlling the weather and harvests and paying homage to the to the beast that they've killed and you know, as a ritual sacrifice in order for that beast to come back the next next year. You know, and really placing nature as a central part of their survival. There's not a lot of modern references in there, and I don't think that William Morris f maybe f feels that modernity in general has that sort of you know, spiritual connection to the natural world anymore. He doesn't seem to be interested in that. <clears throat> There's lots of vague references to tools. Some are not so vague, more or less, but some of them are quite vague of tools and vessels and their purposes and um, certain animals, but none of the animals are really necessarily accurate, like you can't tell what kind of a bird one of the birds is. 
he's not interested in representation. He's not represented in, he's not interested in, you know, anything being realistic. James Ude said, that the, the critic, he says, he's not interested in representation of the things. He's interested in investigating how these civilizations over the course of human history have chosen to represent them. And I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of these forms are so stylized and not representative. I like that stylization. It, it, seems, it seems more personal. You know, like one of his, the people that worked with him on this piece that actually I, I, I know that she actually made some of these is Karen Willenbrink uh, Johnson. And she, she's a phenomenal glass sculptor. And she is really into owls, right? And her owls, viewed from across the room, they're usually a life-size owl on like a birch branch. It's all glass, it's not real birch. It's the, the, it, from across the room, you, it's, a, it's an owl. Like you think there's an owl sitting on the perch. You can't tell that it's made of glass. It is so, re it's hyper-realistic. It's, it's astonishing to look at. I, I mean, that's, that's her answer to the question that, he, that she has, you know. But William Morris is clearly not interested in, in, that, in that realism at all. Also, like, um, you know, just to compare for fun is, you know, the, the, the glass flowers of Harvard. I don't know if any of you have heard of those, but the Blauschka, the father and son team, a long time ago, God, in the 1800s, they made glass flowers, and they're all at this collection at Harvard. And the, uh, it's a biology, you know, uh, biology, the botany department. And you can't, you can't tell that they're made out of glass. They, even if you get them up in your face like this, you still think they're real flowers, um, which is amazing, and it speaks to glasses, uh, the, the material of glasses' capabilities. You know, I, one of the reasons why I'm still fascinated, fascinated by it after 20 years. And there's so many different ways of working. I mean, like my work has nothing to do with this at all, but it's still to totally, utterly fascinating to me. So, this is what about this piece. That's what really you know, really resonates for me that, you know, the forms and the surfaces and the play between the reflected light and the transmitted light, they, they have this sort of, this optical credibility, you know. The, uh, not many of these pieces feel forced. They they're, they're feel legit, you know. But also in the stylization and his personalization, his sort of ritualistic, fetishistic, way of making things gives it this sort of underlying subliminal credibility to me as well. That he's, he's working on something bigger, you know, like each, these objects have power. They're almost shamanistic to me when, in a lot of ways. I'll do one more, a quote from uh, James Ude, which I think sort of sums up the whole thing really well. It's actually a paragraph, but I, it really sort of, sort of hits it uh, for me. We sense the weight of history with Morris's objects. A part of our brain knows that they were relatively recently wrought in glass by Morris in his studio in Washington. And yet our fantasy longs to pursue their sources far back beyond the pale of time. They become remnants of ritual, decontextualized fragments, shards of ceremonies long forgot forgotten, messages from yesterday created today, and still they everywhere echo with the magic of meaning. Morris makes worlds collide, creating a zone of the ever evocative, of the elusive and the strange. This, collection is central, this collision is central to the poetics of the human mind, reflecting our desire to know and yet still to wonder, to see and yet to imagine, to perceive something as palpable and yet willing to glimpse its mystery. Morris is always both specific and poetic. We can readily identify a subject matter while luxuriating in its enigmatic quality. And that's, that's, you know, that sort of definitely sums up how I feel about this piece. Um, I, I thought I'd share just a couple of really quick um, personal anecdotes about William Moore. It's fun to talk about him. He's a character. I actually got to meet him once um, through a friend of a friend. Uh, well, my, my professor at, um, uh, at college, 
he went to Pilchuck back when William Morris was working there and s apparently had, knew some strings to pull because uh, in California Polytechnic State University where I was going to school, it's sort of a small, it's a technical university, but my professor George, he, they had, a, you know, they have an art gallery, an art department, and a, they don't have a glass program per se, but they do have a glass facility. In any case, it was in probably in 1999, so it was, he was probably working on this piece when he had a show at our gallery at school. And um, because of this, this, his way of working with both transmitted and reflected light, he had us pa paint the gallery black, right? This really dark shade of gray. You know, it was always this white box and to paint it black, you know? It only takes three or so coats to make something black. And it's a big gallery, right? It's a pretty big gallery for a college gallery. And um, of course, all the studio art majors had to help paint it, right? And so, and then we had to paint it back to white afterwards. There was like four coats of white. It was just, it was just intense. So we're, you know, but you know, Billy Morris is coming. Oh, it's really exciting. You know, we all love it. Oh, the work is amazing because we were. This was, yeah, this was a long time ago, <laughs> and I, I, I was only, you know, pretty young in my career, and my friend and I. We're, you know, mucking around just still trying to make cups that were straight and to figure out how to do relatively simple things. But we were sort of had a better hand at it than a lot of the other kids in class. And we were like, felt real, real kind of badass about it, you know. And um, um, William Morse came, did his lecture, and then he hung out with the studio art uh, kids for a little while. And at one point, he actually walked down the hall with my buddy Ken and I. And, we, you know, we were just like, you know, and I forget what we were talking. He was asking about the program or something, just being polite. I'm sure he couldn't really care less about us. But we had some work. He came to look at our work that was down in the cave. And I had some goofy picture or something I was proud of. For, because technically, I guess it was sort of hard to do. It was just a vessel. And then Ken had these uh, vessels, these sort of um, f vessel, vessel forms, sculptural vessels that wouldn't have, like they're tiny pots with tiny little things. You could never use them for anything, but they're either round, sort of Japanese looking. He's half Japanese. And, you know, William Morse came down, he's just, you know, looking at stuff and being polite. And, and he was very polite, very, very cool. Um, and he's like, yeah, great. What, you know, what are you interested in your work? And I don't remember what I said. I had nothing, basically, and um, nothing important. <laughs> And I was expecting Ken to say something about, you know, something too very similar because I, I never thought Ken to be the intellectual type. And Ken goes, I'm really interested in the concept of the egg. Because <laughs> you know, his forms are sh shaped like an egg. And I'm like, what? When did you, you never said anything about it like that. You just pull out, where did you pull that out of? And then William Morris is like, yes, all right, the egg. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Let's talk about developing the egg. And I'm just like, what? And, and he's right. You know, he's like, what, what is the underlying concept? What are you working on? And, you know, he's working, on, William Morris working on this. And, we, you know, Ken talking about the egg. He's like, all right, yeah, let's talk about the egg. Come on. I don't want to talk about your stupid picture. You know, they've been doing that stuff for, for 3,000 years. I thought that, I, you know, I always, I always think of that because I was just like so shut down at that moment. <laughs> and then... And then the, um, the other story actually just happened very recently. I have a one representative gallery that um, shows my work, the Wexler Gallery based in Philadelphia, and he takes my work uh, around to these trade shows like Sofa Chicago is one of them. And um, there's one in New York actually happening tonight. But Sofa Chicago is sculptural objects and fine art, functional art, sculptural objects and functional art. and. Um, he, rep he has a lot of William Morris's uh, work that he um, sells on the secondary market. You know, oh, uh, elder collectors are starting to not buy pieces anymore, but you know, sell their pieces and sort of you know hone their collections down. And so, he, Mr. Wexler is in charge of uh, reselling the work. So there's lots of William Morris's out, and lots of times they're sitting literally feet from my work which is both flattering and also sort of nerve-wracking and it feels weird and um, it, it's cool. But, you know, we're setting up the pieces and I sometimes have to go there to install the work. And, you know, it's fun because you get to see, I get to see all of his other works and stuff. But so we're setting up and um, there's a bunch of Billy Morris's things and he's got this 
one piece on a shelf, and it's like this little guy. He's from his Man Adorned series, and it's only about this big. And it's like this little sort of tribal looking dude hunkered down in this pose. You know, I can picture him clearly. He's got this clearly rendered face. It's like a little, you know, old African dude hunkered around a campfire, sort of looks like. And below that, on a shelf about five feet below, he's got a, a whole set of bones, you know, like all these skeletal forms. That are really cool looking. And I'm just finished installing my piece. It's hanging over people's heads. I'm really nervous and sort of freaking out. And, I just want to kind of get out of there, so I go down to grab my backpack. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> on the shelf, I hit my oh. head. That little dude jumps up, because it's not attached to anything yet, because still, everyone's still setting up. That little dude jumps, and he rolls, and uh, you know, he can't do anything. I just watch that guy roll. The thing is worth probably about eighty-five dollars or $95,000. He rolls to within an eighth of an inch of the edge of that shelf. <laughs> I, I, you not, an eighth of an inch. Had it gone down, it would have fallen on the one below, which was $155,000. <laughs> so, so you know like when you're, you know, you're buttering your toast and it falls butter side down, or the traffic light or whatever, it's like, I used up all my karma at once. <laughs> like for years, like before and after. So I, every time I get that traffic light now, I try and I just be like, Think of that little dude <laughs> lying on his side, completely undamaged. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know what would have happened. There was probably insurance, but in any case, yeah, that was my, that was my other William Morris story. So that's pretty much what I had to talk about. And if you had any questions, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, you can feel free to blurt them out. <clears throat> Absolutely. It's like that kind of 19th century thing where you just go get a hundred bugs or birds and stick yeah. them all. Yeah, cabinet. Yeah, there is a little bit of the, like the cabinet of curiosities collection sort of style of collection of oddities. Indeed, I think the, I I hadn't thought of the pinned bugs uh, idea, but that's definitely apt. Yeah, Did absolutely. He came here and installed it himself. I don't know if he. I think they probably mock some stuff up on the table. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I, I, I think they could probably be pretty much arranged any way they want. I bet there was a lot of standing back and looking at the interplay of color, you know, that you don't want to have two matte, well, there's two matte orange pieces right in the middle or right next to each other. But it's fairly evenly distributed in form and color. I don't know if it was specific. It didn't, I haven't uncovered anything that said there was a specific layout. But this piece was designed specifically for this room as a commission. So, I, yeah, it was. Yeah, he worked with the the director at the time of the museum. Uh, obviously, you know, they had this sort of challenging space, and uh, they probably wanted to acquire something from William Morris and asked him if he could come and see if he could do something with this space. And he said, "Oh, I have this collection of things." Come to think of it, I don't know. That's my. That's just me talking. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah. dude works, he has a staggering amount of work. Like, I think they were probably doing, you know, 10, 12 hour days when they, could, when they could. The way a lot of glass blowers work uh, is seasonal because it's so hot a lot of the times. And so I know that um, for a time before William Morris had his own studio, they would do like three months on and three months off sort of a thing. And Depending on the size and complexity of a piece, you know, I, I would say the av just off the top of my head, the average time that one of these pieces took was probably in between 30 minutes and an hour, piece by piece. So there's 399 pieces, so that's, that's a lot of time. But these, are, again, are just tiny little things that are sort of informing a lot of his other works. I, I really encourage you to, to take a look at some of his other works because you can see how these are more like studies for larger, more involved pieces, um, especially in this series, the artifact series. 
and some of those pieces I know, um, like he would make a vessel form, like a, some of these vessels forms perhaps, but like a vessel form that was you know, yay big, which is a technical feat in itself in order to make a piece of glass that size. And it would have a powder, you know, a, a glass drawing of hunters on the hunt on the side of that. And that whole thing takes, you know, probably a couple of hours at least to get started. But then he'll have off to the side in another oven a pair of ravens, right? And he'll come out with these torches and he'll take, someone will hold the vessel up and he'll take the, the raven, you know, and put that on the side. And he got that raven on there. He said, okay, let's bring out another raven. And then we're going to tweak that. And the ravens are fighting over, you know, a little medicine bag, you know. And they're, so I think some of those pieces probably would take a better part of a day, some of them, I believe. Or maybe if he's lucky, he'd come out with, you know, two or three of those in a day. Um, but he's made thousands of them. So uh, to make all these, I don't know, several weeks probably at, at, at minimum for all these. Yeah? Well, if he was experimenting with stuff and developing prototypes for things, then he would probably get some throwaways too. So. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of throwaways as well, yeah. A lot of stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, well, some of them that have these ragged edges, you know, um, that crackled texture up in that one up near the corner, that's an example of dunking it in the water and it creates that texture. But a lot of these ones where the glass is actually really rough and shattered around the edges, you know, that's taking, taking it to about as far as you can take it without it physically crumbling. So, and a lot of his work has that broken quality, like, like it was actually dug up in an archeological dig. There, there's, you know, things sheared off, arms and legs missing on some of the, on some of the creatures. That sort of thing. A vessel looks like it's cracked apart and then been put back together. So it's, it's a kind of minions heap. It's like um, what you would throw away, you know, when archaeologists always they look for the... A midden, yeah. For the pottery. They look for all the broken pottery, so yeah. that's like the pile of broken pottery. Or the oyster shells, yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, that's, a good, that's an interesting way to look at it, absolutely. Um, a lot of that is probably in, in some of the, I'll have to, I'll look around, you know, in some of the, the textures and the surface treatments. Um, in some of these, some of these studies, maybe not quite so much as some of the larger pieces, you know, I, I can, I can infer as to some of the, how some of these are made. Uh, a lot of them have to do with, um, with using specialized torches and, you know, just like, you know, when you have a team of seven people, you got 14 hands. So there's a lot of things. Uh, I, I work personally by myself, so I don't, I'm, I'm not able to, to have all those hands. Uh, this piece right, right here, it's like a little medicine bag with, with um, like a, it's, it's tied with, the, with a tie around there. I, I, don't, I don't know how he did that, that, little, that little tie. That's, it's really cool. I wish I could do that. I don't know. You know, glass weather, they say about, glass blowing, it, it's, it's very available. Like once you see it done, uh, that's the joke is the glass blower, how many glass blowers does it change a light bulb? A uh, uh, hundred, one to change the light bulb, and 99 to say I can do that. Because <laughs> once you see it, it's available to everyone. You know, that's why they kept, you know, why the Italians tried, they s kept everyone in Italy for so long. They, you know, they had all those guys down on lock and key because once you see how it's done, you know, if you practice hard enough, you can do it. Um, and that's why I think William Morris worked primarily, you know, by him, by him um, you know, sort of on an island, <laughs> as it were. Um, I, I, I sort of forgot what I was going to say. Some, um, Betsy, when, uh, when we were walking around, Betsy pointed out something to me that I should probably share that some, another um, visitor showed her one time is that there's a little cup down here. And I don't, we don't, we're not sure what the actual story is, but I think it's cool. There's a little, little a cup down here. It's like a sort of a three-lobed cup underneath this cyclops gourd. And in there, you can see there's a little form in there. And it's, it, it looks to me, um, and the, so the story goes, that it's a, it's a real dead bird. Um, <laughs> And I, it, maybe the story is that the bird was, you know, was in the studio when he was making the piece, and and uh, 
<laughs> and, and somehow banged his head on the window or something, but I, I like that it's, um, I like that it's got, it found a home here. I think that's cool. It's so, like he's nested in there. <laughs> well, I don't know if anyone has any other questions. If afterwards, I can be happy to answer questions too. Yeah, down, down below, whatever happens next.